Right. Okay. So this is uh, uh, where we conclude uh, the poem, uh, continuing with the uh, the coronation, uh, the farewell speech of Flecknoe and the coronation of uh, Shadwell. As I said, the Shadwell has nothing to say really in this poem. All the talking is done by Flecknoe. So he's talking about uh, about how Shadwell is uh, even greater than him in folly, how his art and his plays are not of the heritage of Johnson or Fletcher, Fletcher but of uh, Haywood, Shirley, Ogilvy, and himself. So the last part of Matt Flecknoe, uh, Flecknoe's concluding speech, my argument, therefore, is that it is a biting satire on the art of Shadwell. And these are, this is where the references get personal, intense, and there is a certain degree of lampooning. Now, how is this degree of lampooning done? You see, lampooning is done where Dryden will magnify Shadwell's physical attributes, his scatological references, so that Shadwell becomes not only ridiculous in the sense that he's foolish or that he's a bad poet, but also in gross physical terms. So it is these two metaphors of physical deformity and uh, scatological production that uh, create Shadwell as a figure of lampoon. So uh, thou art my blood where Johnson has no part what share have we in nature or in art? Where did his wit on learning fix a brand and rail at arts he did not understand? So the implication is that Shadwell does not understand the art of comedy at all, the craft of comedy. So Shadwell's aesthetic sophistication is, as it were, demolished. Shadwell understands only farce. If there is a process of othering here, then Dryden is the symbol of high culture, is the symbol of high comedy, is the symbol of proper taste, and Shadwell is the symbol of poor culture, poor literature, and farces rather than comedies. So it is in this way that you can see the Dryden is creating a kind of a point and a margin across the point so that, you know, Shadwell is forever cast into this margin of obscurity. So where made he love in Prince Nicander's vein or swept the dust in Psyche's humble strain? Now, these are references to Shadwell's uh, play Psyche where uh, a character, one of the characters is called Prince Nikon, Nikander. Nikander makes love or professes love in a very humble strain. So where made he love in Prince Nikander's vein or swept the dust in Psyche's humble strain. So Shadwell's plays have a humble uh, <clears throat> rhetoric. Now, please remember that in this case, humble is poor. Right. Therefore, humble in this case is refers to Shadwell's aesthetic incompatibility, his his inadequacies in the uh, in the construction of the rhetoric of comedy, his inadequacy with language. Where sold he bargains, whip stitch, kiss my arse, promised a play and dwindled to a farce. Now. Once again, these are references to uh, commonplace usage of language, of profanities, which uh, Dryden accuses Shadwell of using in his place. Of course, Dr Shadwell actually did not do so. But Shadwell is being accused by Dryden of using profanity in his languages so that his languages are very, very rustic and also extremely, you know, what they'll call in poor taste. And then Shadwell promises a play 
and this is the main accusation shadwell had claimed to be a writer of sophisticated humorous comedy dryden is accusing him of writing poor farces so there's a hierarchy that he's creating the dryden is the higher higher poet who writes sophisticated comedy whereas shadwell claims to write johnsonian comedy of humors but actually writes very poor farces physical comedies which border on the obscene so in this particular couplet dryden is bringing a charge of profanity and obscenity against shadwell when did his views from fletcher seems perloin perloin is steel uh, <coughs> as thou hold etheridge transfuse to thine now this is a much more serious allegation that he's now making he's suggesting that shadwell is not only a writer of poor plays of farces poor uh, literary abilities but he's also indulging in plagiarism plagiarism is copying without permission right without acknowledgement so shadwell is stealing lines from better authors like etheridge or fletcher fletcher once again please remember is the jacobian co tragic comic writer bomond of the bomond and fletcher fame and etheridge george etheridge we've already encountered of the man of mode so but thou so you are copying dryden is accusing or techno is acknowledging here that shadwell copies from fletcher and etheridge whole seats but so transfused as oil on waters flow his always floats above thine sinks below so even then when shadwell copies scenes from etheridge or fletcher they are incompatible with his writing right so his writing is so poor that they are prominent whereas shadwell's writing sinks below just as oil floats on water similarly the passages of fletcher and etheridge are prominent whereas shadwell's uh, passages are extremely uh, obsolete or you can say they sink they are extremely uh, what you can call unprofessional now this is thy province this thy wondrous way so he's referring to now grub street this is thy province this is thy kingdom this thy wondrous way so this thy uh, you can say strange uh, wonderful path to travel new humors to invent for each new play now shadwell uh, in the uh, dedication to virtuoso his play the virtuoso had suggested that he had invented three new humors there were already if you remember the five humors uh, that uh, ben johnson had talked about rather the four humors and uh, shadwell in the virtuoso claimed to have created three new humors right and therefore dryden is mocking that claim and saying uh, this new humors to invent for each new play the accusation being that shadwell's plays are actually so farcical that these humors are nonsense this is that boasted bias of thy mind by which way one way to dullness is inclined now this refers to a metaphor from the sport of bowling if you've seen the sport of bowling you'll see that you know there are uh, these five uh sort of objects which are rolled by you know, which are sort of uh which are toppled by the rolling of a ball now this ball this iron ball if it is heavy on one side will move in a particular direction so dryden is drawing drawing that uh metaphor and he's saying that in your selfhood there is a boasted bias so your personality is inclined is heavy on one side and on which side is it heavy it is heavy on the side of 
dullness right so you are your personality is marked by its propensity its heaviness its stress on dullness uh, which makes the thy writing lean on one side still and in all changes that way bends thy will so because you your personality itself is dull you are naturally foolish all your writings lean on that side so all your writings are naturally bad naturally poor because your personality your nature itself is inclined to the side of dullness so a direct equivalence between shadwell's folly between shadwell's stupidity and shadwell's poor literature dryden is drawing this sort of logical conclusion that because shadwell is a fool he can only produce poor literature nor let thy mountain belly make pretence of likeness thine's a timpani of sense so now this is where you could see once again the satire becomes almost a lampoon because dryden will refer now to shadwell's corpulent fat frame so he says nor let thy mountain belly make pretense of likeness thine's a timpani of sense so your uh, uh, fat belly as it were uh, has nothing there's no sense there's only uh, a blank sound papa awaaz jeta ke bol hoy timpani of sense now dryden will once again use this in a scatological way that your belly contains is full only of bloated gas right and this will be the subterranean wind that will come out from flecknoe also which will uh, uh, come at right at the end of the poem but there is once again an illusion to the body to the belly and it's being bloated with gas so shadwell is actually a gas bag as it were a ton of man in thy large bulk is writ now ton is in this case a large container right a large barrel which could hold approximately 250 gallons of wine 252 gallons is a huge barrel right so your and and you can see you know the shape of uh, shadwell is like a barrel because his middle is protruded with fat therefore a ton of man in thy large bulk is writ but thou but sure thou art but a kilderkin of wit now kilderkin is an irish word uh, i'm sorry scottish word which means uh, a small cask containing say 16 gallons of wine so it's a very small flask so you have a huge body but your mind your intelligence is extremely small so dryden is comparing shadwell's girth his bulk with his very small scanty intelligence like mine thy gentle numbers feebly creep thy tragic muse gives smiles thy comic sleep now dryden demolishes shadwell's plays he says that your comedy puts us to sleep and your tragedy instead of inspiring pity and fear is only producing smiles right so your numbers are feeble your rhymes are feeble now there's an allusion here because dryden himself was accused by buckingham in the rehearsal in a play called the rehearsal buckingham had accused that dryden's plays caused uh, dryden's tragedies caused smiles so dryden is referring to that re play the rehearsal and he's saying that like me so you have accused me of producing uh, plays that put people to sleep similarly like me your plays also do the same so you are a writer of pathetic plays with whatever goal goal is anger bitterness thou settest thyself to write so the satirist writes with some anger resentment right either anger against society or anger against any person so 
with whatever goal, goal is associated with the liver. Liver is, was the seat of emotions. Therefore, you know, you have the gall bladder near the liver. So gall is also the place where bile is produced. Bile, remember, is acidic. So with whatever vitriol, with whatever anger, as a satirist you want to write, thy if inoffensive satires never bite. So your inoffensive satires, note the play there that Shadwell does not write Roman satire. He writes only, you know, distorted uh, satires in the sense that he can create only half men, half beast. So thy inoffensive satires never bite. So your satires to fail. So your comedy produces laughter. Your tragedy produces, I'm sorry, your tragedy produces laughter. Your comedies put people to sleep and your satires have no bite or have no pungency or have no effect of ridicule on others. In thy felonious heart, though, venom lies. But does that mean that Shadwell is of a very mild disposition? No. You are a felonious. You are a stealing. Felonious is criminal. In your criminal heart, though venom lies, you have a lot of venom inside you. You have a lot of anger. You have a lot of spite against people. It does, but touch thy Irish pen and dies. Now, once again, I am referring once again, or Dryden is referring to Mac Fleckno, Fleckno being the Irish priest and poet, and uh, Shadwell being his son. So he says, it touches Mac Fleckno, it touches thy Irish pen and dies. Now, once again, Irish is here associated with stupidity and folly. And therefore, you know, it touches thy Irish pen and dies. Please remember that, incidentally, one must remind you that at this point of time, England was still colonizing Ireland. And uh, the attitude of the English towards the Irish was one of great, you know, one of extreme patronizing and distaste. You will remember that uh, one of the major Irish satirists later on would be Jonathan Swift, who would, uh, who would, uh, with great venom, satirize this English uh, colonization of the Irish later on. We shall see that when we read Gulliver's Travels in greater detail. But here you can see the bias of the English against the Irish when he says, it touches thy Irish pen and dies, because the Irish pen cannot produce any sophisticated satire. Thy genius calls thee not to purchase fame in keen iambics, but mild anagram. Now, this refers to the poets, the late poets of the metaphysical age, like Herbert or even Marvel, who wrote poems which were designed as altars or butterflies. So, the structure of the poem, you know, the appearance of the poem on the page was designed to resemble anagrams, acrostics. So the poem itself appeared to be a kind of a figure. So lines like this, this, and, uh, and the poem had a shape, as it were. Now, this was dismissed by the Augustans as something very trivial. So Dryden is suggesting that your poetry is not in keen iambics, not in proper meter. But your poems are showpieces only in mild anagram. Leave writing plays and choose for thy command some peaceful province in acrostic land. Once again, acrostic designer poems, as it were. There thou mayst wings display. So poems which are shaped like wings and altars rise, alter gradually, you know, the poems which had, you know, six uh, words in first line five words in the second, four words in the third, so shaped like an altar, and torture one poor word 10,000 ways. Or if thou wouldst thy different talents suit, set thy own songs and sing them to thy lute. Now he has already referred to uh, Shadwell playing the lute in front of the king, and Fleckno having played the lute in front of the king of Portugal. So. 
He says that you have no musical sense, you have no rhythmical sense, you can light only stupid showy poems and if you want, you can create discordant and chaotic music. He said, so this is the part till which Plekno's speech comes. Now, so far, what has uh, Dryden accused Shadwell of? Dryden has accused Shadwell of producing only farces. Therefore, what he does is he ends this poem with a farcical scene from Shadwell's text. Now, Shadwell's text, the virtuoso, in, the, in Shadwell's text, the virtuoso, Sir Formal, of whom we have talked about, Sir, let Sir Formal's oratory be thine, is in the midst of a high flowing speech when two characters, Bruce and Longville, silence him by opening a trap door. Now, you see, a trap door would be a, a kind of a contraption on the stage, which if you could operate with a spring if you removed, then suddenly there would be a void in the stage. So it would be used in farcical scenes so people could disappear. For example, in the grave digger scene in Hamlet, the trap door would be opened and the body would be lowered into the grave. So this was the trap door. Now, in, in this particular play, uh, in this particular play, uh, Shadwell, uh, Shadwell's virtuoso, Bruce and Longville open a trap so that in the midst of a high flowing speech, Sir Formal suddenly disappears and this farcical scene produces laughter. What Dryden does is to show how Shadwell is primarily a farcical writer, is to replicate this trapdoor scene. So what happens? In the midst of this final speech of Plekno, he said, but his last words were scarcely heard, for Bruce and Longville had a trap prepared, and down the scent the yet declaiming bard. So in the middle of this speech, bard is the poet, here referring to Plekno again, as Plekno is making the speech, suddenly the trap door is opened, and Flecknoe disappears underground, sinking. He left his drugget robe behind. Now, drugget robe is once again referring to, as we had said, the Norwich drugget. This is the coarse sack cloth manufactured from Newcastle and Norwich, which was of very coarse quality. Right. Now, the analogy here is to the Bible. In the Bible, in the book of Kings, in the book of Kings, Elijah, the priest, Elijah, the priest, goes up to heaven and his mantle falls on his son, Elisha. Elijah is pronounced, is spelt as J-A-H. E L I J A H and Elisha E L I S A H. So in the Bible, you have this passage where Elisha says, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elijah saw it and cried, My father, my father. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back. So this is the passing of the mantle of holiness from Elijah to Elisha, from the father to the son. This is a deliberate Christian metaphor. Now, in this case, what happens is that the mantle is not of holiness, but of dullness and poor poetry. Therefore, the mantle is not one of silk. The mantle is not glorious, but the mantle is made of coarse Norwich drugget, right? So the drugget robe, as it were, now flies and falls 
from the father, the priest Flecno, to the son, the poor poet Shadwell. And you see, Elijah goes up to heaven. And Eli, I, I'm sorry, and Shadwell, uh, uh, sorry, Flecno goes down to hell. Right. So Elijah, the glorious priest, goes upwards to heaven. Flecno, the poor poet, goes downwards towards hell. And what creates this, this wind which produces, uh, uh, which leads to the mantle flying to Shadwell is a subterranean wind. So it is as it were, uh, Flecno is passing wind as he goes. And it is this, once again, scatological reference. So this wind is the wind that brings the mantle on to Shadwell's body with double portion of his father's art. So just as Elijah had wanted double the wholeness of his father's glory, similarly, Shadwell gets double the portion of his father's dullness. So that then is the climax. Once again, there are two climaxes here. One is the coronation and the other is the final climactic moment when uh, you see, there's a Christian passing of the robe of the priest onto, uh, from Flecknoe to Shadwell, as well as the royal crown from Flecknoe to Shadwell. So two sort of metaphors coincide here, coalesce here. One is the metaphor of the passing of power, the kingly metaphor, the regal metaphor of coronation, as well as the priestly metaphor of passing on the robe and initiation of the priest into the sacred art of mysticism. If coronation, if secular coronation signifies power, then religious initiation signifies knowledge. Dryden suggests that Shadwell has the power of only dullness, whilst uh, Dryden has the power, I'm sorry, Shadwell has the power of dullness and that Shadwell has double the non-intelligence or ignorance of Flecknoe. So Flecknoe passes on the mantle to Shadwell as the emperor of dullness. What has Dryden done? Dryden has created a poem and you saw the context in an attempt to reduce a rival poet into obscurity and uphold him as a symbol of poor literature. He has created a deliberate epic heroic structure, mock heroic structure, whereby he has taken elements of the epic. The elements of the epic is monarchy, empire, battle, coronation. It's also taken metaphors from religion, the initiation of the priest, of Christ's arrival, and of the passing of the mantle from Elijah to Elisha. He's taken these heroic metaphors, and then he has superimposed the pathetic upon these heroics, which juxtaposed a heroic parallel followed it up with a bathos. So empire, nonsense. Battle with wit and intelligence. Great transfer of power, transfer of ignorance. This is how the poem operates. And in doing so, it creates Shadwell as an emblem of three things. One is of eternal folly, complete darkness and non-enlightenment, one. Two, an absolutely poor poet who steals lines from other people, whose comedies create sleep, whose tragedies produce smiles, and whose satires never bite. So in every genre that he experiments, Shadwell is poor and reduced to a dooms. Also, Dryden completely dismisses Shadwell's 
uh, literary uh, outputs by referring to his major plays and shows that he is not the inheritor of Johnson of any kind of sophisticated classical literature, but only of but only of farces. So emperor of folly, emperor of poor literature, and also the king of Grub Street of poor culture and poor taste. Aiding Dryden's effort in this poem is also his art of caricature and lampoon. He magnifies Shadwell's gigantic body. He refers to his mountain belly, refers to the scatology, and thereby suggests that Shadwell's is filled with empty gas and wastage rather than any substance. It is thus. I am arguing that the mock heroic moat is used by Dryden together with allusions from classical literature, from Christian sources, and from contemporary allusions to Shadwell and Flecknoe's plays to create Shadwell as or reduce Shadwell to laughter and complete uh, ridicule into a figure of poor poetry. This is how the satire of uh, of Shadwell, uh, this the satire of Mac Flecknoe, the son of Flecknoe, the Irish son of Flecknoe, operates. Right. It is with that, therefore, that I am bringing the discussion of the poem to a close, and I'll stop the recording at this point.